Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. My name is Alice Maggio, and I'm a board member at the Schumacher Center for New Economics. And I'm our host for the day and moderator of this great panel. And um, I have been on the board for the last number of years at the Schumacher Center. But before that, I worked at the Schumacher Center on the local currency program Berkshires. And this theme of local production is very close to my heart and to the work that we did on Berkshires. Um, I am currently a project steward at the Working World in New York City, and I work um, helping to develop worker-owned cooperatives and offer financing to worker-owned cooperatives. Um, but today I'm here in my capacity as a Schumacher Center board member. So that's me. Um, I, I'm also going to introduce the Schumacher Center and um, the theme for today. And then I'm going to introduce our panelists. And then we're going to kick off the conversation with some remarks from each panelist and then conversation and taking questions from you in the audience. So um, there is a question and answer box that you can um, that you can use, and that will help us see what you want to know from our panelists and I can pass along your questions. So please feel free to drop questions in as they come to you today. Um, so I just wanna kind of lay the groundwork here, um, introduce the Schumacher Center. Um, so founded in 1980, the Schumacher Center for New Economics works to envision the elements of a just and regenerative global economy, undertakes to apply these elements in its home region of the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts and then develops the educational programs to share the results broadly and encourage replication. This year, 2023, marks the 50th anniversary of the book, Small is Beautiful, written by E.F. Schumacher. This 50th anniversary is our opportunity to advance solutions that build on Schumacher's vision. Central to our 2023 celebrations are this monthly series, convene, convening new economic thinkers builders and activists to share their latest insights and advance common paths forward. The 2023 Schumacher Conversations bring together change makers from a range of fields whose work today is actively shaping a small is beautiful future. Focused around key themes and fields of activism, each online conversation will chart actionable pathways towards a just regenerative planet. This month's theme is localizing production communities supporting industry. Today, there's a growing recognition that the prevailing economic system is holding back collective agendas for a ha habitable planet and fairer distribution of wealth. As the world catches up to the urgency of climate change and growing inequality, the question of scale once again returns to the fore. As Schumacher extolled in Small is Beautiful, a shift from the trend of uncontrollable globalization toward place-based, ecologically responsible, and human-scale economic activity remains essential to a just and regenerative future. Today's panelists are those rebuilding equitable production ecosystems rooted in their own places. Each participant represents a particular approach to inclusive wealth building arrived at through community participation and cooperation. And I'm really pleased to introduce them all to you today. So I'm gonna introduce everybody and then each person is gonna get a chance to share some remarks. Um, so today we have with us Zita Cobb, who is founder and CEO of Shorefast, a community development nonprofit and an innkeeper of the award-winning Fogo Island Inn on a remote island in Newfoundland, Canada. We also have with us Michael Schumann, an economist, attorney, author, and entrepreneur and a leading authority on community economics. He's director of local economy programs. Uh, he has been director of local economy programs for Neighborhood Associates Corporation and adjunct professor at Bard Business School in New York City. He is also the publisher of the online Main Street Journal. And another Michael is with us today. Michael Pardis is executive director of the Bronx Cooperative Development Initiative Bronx Cooperative Development Initiative is a co community-led effort to build an equitable, sustainable, and democratic local economy that creates wealth and ownership for low-income low people of color. 
So those are our beautiful and wonderful panelists. Um, and I will turn it over to Zita um, to share some remarks. Um, and I encourage you all to keep keep in mind that you can share questions and an questions questions in the um, Q and A box, um, and we can pass those along later. So Zita, I will turn it over to you. What would you like to share with us today? Thank you, Alice. Um, okay, well, I um, am from this island off the coast of Newfoundland and Labrador, northeast coast, and I think as much as any place can be an example for what's happened in the last 400 years, we're probably uh, a good example and a bad example at the same time. Uh, this island called Fogo Island was settled by people who came mostly from England and Ireland uh, to fish for cod. And I, I'm descended from those people. The, the economic model that life happened within was actually kind of a globalized model because the merchants, as we call them, the people who controlled the salt fish trade that we were a part of, we were in a way we settled at their behest. So on this little island, we fished and made our own decisions about what kind of gear, what time of year, what should we go out today or not today. We organized our own lives. And really, we were pretty self-determining people for 350 years, except we didn't control our access to markets and we didn't understand where the fish was sold. So I grew up in this way that the market and the people who controlled the market, we didn't know them, we didn't understand it and they were the bad people. And we had incredibly profound ecological logic, profound social logic. We knew how to live in small communities and get along with each other, even if we didn't actually like each other. And we had no economic logic. And I jokingly say that I've been, I've lived in three centuries and I'm 64 years old because really I grew up until I was 10 in the 19th century. And in the, when I was 10, the worst of the 20th century in the form of the industrialization of the fishery came down on top of us. And so arrived these incredibly large ships like factory ships that were supported with hospital ships. And it took no time at all to take just about every last fish out of the ocean. So welcome to the industrial age. Uh, and so my father at the time, uh, at that time, he was my father then and now, uh, but at that time said, you've got to go to school and you've got to figure out how this money business works because he figured out they must be turning the fish into money. He couldn't, he had no other explanation for this relentless fishing. And so I did, I studied business and my career was in wave division multiplexing, which really was now the third century I've lived in, which are the little bits that have enabled the digital age, enable us to do what we're doing now. So uh, to come forward, I my career was away and I, I came moved back home in 2006 to try and put another leg on the economy. Uh, when I was in university, uh, Small is Beautiful came out. And I was saying just before the talk, I actually still have my original copy of it. And some parts of it have aged incredibly well. And some parts, you know, well, have, like all of us, have we all aged well in every way? Probably not. Uh, but much of it still informs how we think about things. One of the things that really I, I'm, it is about Schumacher's focus on intermediate and, and appropriate technology. And, and clearly these massive factory ships were in, inappropriate and still remain so. When I came home and started to work uh, with the community and with my brothers on the island, we did some things, we set up this registered charity called Shorefast, and our goal was to put another leg on the economy that complements the fishery. Mercifully, on Fogo Island, the fishery still exists. It's the most important industry, and it is owned by a cooperative, and that makes all the difference. I am certain that we wouldn't be living on Fogo Island today if our fishery was owned by a distant capital owner, without a question, because what a pain in the butt it is to get fish off that little island to the main island like we, we would have been optimized for something besides community so ownership matters and if i was ever to get a tattoo i'd get it on my face and it would say it matters who owns what and so we started with that in mind we set up the charity which owns the economic assets so our, our model are, is that we started some businesses i'm a big believer in business i believe it matters who owns what and we run a number of programs specifically around art and geology, and we have an environmental oceans program. <clears throat> we built an inn. The inn is made of the place, as close as we could come to making something of a place. And in a way, 
you know, it would have been nice to think we could have lived on our little perfect island and not have to deal with the globalized economy. But that is a dream that wasn't going to happen. And, and I, in some ways, I think we kind of feel that we need to instrumentalize ourselves before we get instrumentalized by somebody else. You know, this idea of trading in our own assets to the benefit of the local community, because effectively the inn and the furniture business that we have when we started a little handline fish business really belong to the beneficial owners or the people who live on the island. So that's the work that we've been doing for the last 10 years. But more recently, uh, we have been working on what we, we we finished something we call a community economies pilot project. And we partnered with four other communities across Canada, much differently sized ones, differently located, Victoria, BC, and, and two quite large communities in Ontario and another smaller community in Ontario. And we really looked at what does it take to strengthen community economies? Our theory of change is that there are too many of us to take care of us all one by one. So if we can build strong communities, the communities can take care of us. And if there's no functioning economy that serves the place, there won't be a place. And so the four areas that we Focus on in the pilot, which I think are still valid for how do you strengthen community economies. Number one, let's recognize that most places in the world, including us, it's a mixed economy. There are that we we went to great labors to map the economic actors in our local economy, and there are sometimes enormous banks, sometimes it's the federal government, it's sometimes it's a local person who's doing some little business down the road, and so we're all a part of our local economy. So understanding that the four areas we focused on is data. It is very a rare that communities, especially the smaller ones, have access to the kind of data they need to actually be good stewards of their own local economy. Access to financial capital is an enormous problem, uh, it, maybe more so in Canada than in the United States, because you at least have the Community Reinvestment Act. We don't have such a thing. Uh, and so the plumbing, I mean, Canada has roughly 5,000, well, it's not roughly, 5,162 incorporated communities, 634 Indigenous communities, and probably only 25% of them are banked and properly fin financed. The other one we focused on, which may in the end be the most important one, is the architectures for collaboration. That recognizing we do not have, I mean, even if we, we, even if we could agree on, the, on what the biggest problems are, and we, people rarely do, um, we don't have the architectures to come together to solve them. We were very influenced by a book uh, by a fellow named Rajan, who's at the University of Chicago, called The Third Pillar. And he makes a simple assertion. Human societies rest on three pillars, governments, markets, and communities. And of course, the community pillar has been hollowed out to the point of, in many places, dysfunction. And unless and until we can strengthen it, none of the things we're trying to accomplish is really going to land well, because most policy and most bigger scale things you know, die when they hit the pavement or hit the road and are never uptaken properly. So building those architectures for collaboration within communities and across pillars is, is the focus of our pilot. And the last focus is just building the, the skill sets and mindsets in local places to be able to, to be driving, to be able to drive our own economy because you know dignity uh, starts with agency and economic dignity is the beginning of that. So that's where we are at. We'd like to launch a center that we are not quite ready for, but we're mapping our way to a, a platform because if, if you want to build a network, we need a platform to be able to have a center for community economies. Thank you, Zita. I can't wait to dig in more um, and learn more in conversation. Um, I think we can turn it over to you, Michael Schumann, um, and then uh, we'll hear what you have to share about Small is Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Alice. And thank you, Zita, for those introductory remarks. Uh, very pleased to be with you all today. Uh, it's morning for me, even though it's afternoon for many of you. I want to, since I'm a bit of a slideaholic, I want to share some images and slides for the 10 minutes that I, I want to talk to you. And, uh, all of us have our own special relationship with Ernst Schumacher. Mine was also in 1974 when I was a student at Stanford University. I was, I was a freshman and took a seminar on Small is Beautiful that was very influential. In fact, 
this was kind of what I looked like, the guy on the left. And I decided to leave school and work on the California Nuclear Safeguards Initiative. Uh, and that brought me to the pathway of David Brower, who was running Friends of the Earth. Um, I worked in and around Friends of the Earth for a number of years, but I did go back to school and got a law degree, thinking that that would be the best way of changing the world. Uh, and I won't go through the entire odyssey, but over the 40 years that followed, uh, I became a real fan of all things local economy, including writing for books and helping launch an organization called Bali, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies with Judy Wicks and a bunch of other people. It's now Common Future. But I really have come to the conclusion that economic development, economic prosperity rests on four basic principles. And that is, one, a community should maximize the percentage of jobs in locally owned business. Number two, we should maximize the diversification of the economy locally, which means greater local self-reliance. Number three, we should spread models of triple bottom line success, that is, not just profitable businesses, but businesses that are good for the environment and for community and for other stakeholders. And finally, we need to create an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Now, I have many theories of change, but the one I want to talk about today is from another person who is a great um, mentor of mine. And this is a famous economist named Kenneth Boulding. And Kenneth Boulding once said, anything that exists is possible. And what that little adage led me to do is to be a great storyteller. You know, I collect stories like Noah collected animals. And I collect stories of local community success and local business success. And what I have been moving toward trying to do is create an international inventory of success stories of great models of local business success and local policy success called the Locopedia. Like the Wikipedia, it would be open source and anyone could add data to it. I've been doing this for 10 plus years and honestly, the project was way too big to gain traction. But over the last five years, I have found an entry point that I thought I would share with you folks today. And that is to focus initially, not on all local businesses, but on the local businesses that Native Americans have been developing in the 550 plus federally recognized reservations in the United States. And the Indigipedia is really an effort to build for Native Americans a basic template for great businesses. Now, as most of you know, uh, Native American reservations are the repository of the greatest degree of poverty, suicide, alcoholism, drug abuse. You go through the list of so social pathologies. And the history of Native Americans uh, is not unfortunately well known, including the fact that literally millions were exterminated as America was settled. So what's left in Native America are reservations with very, very few functional businesses. For the last five years, I've been working with the Northwest Area Foundation on a project we called Vibrant Tribal Economies. And we were trying to spell out what are the basic businesses that every tribal settlement needs in order to be a reasonably decent place to live. And these are the kinds of things that we came up with. And this is where we're gonna start collecting data from tribes around the United States about what small scale businesses exist. For example, in affordable housing, uh, the woman on the right 
Um, she runs a economic development program for the CSKT tribe in the northwest part of Montana. And they are building a tiny home factory, which I just did a business plan for them. Another thing we want to take track of are what are basic business support programs in Native American reservations, things like what are the finance opportunities, incubators, maker spaces, mentoring, placemaking. And an example of this would be uh, another woman, Charlene Johnson, that I've worked with in the last two years. Uh, she runs a program for the Crow Reservation, also in Montana. And we did a design for a business incubator there that just got a several million dollars of funding from various federal programs. So they're often running with it. And that in combination with their tribal college, I think is gonna be a great font of entrepreneurship activity. And then finally, to keep track of policies, what are the cutting edge policies in Native American reservations that will make a difference for economic development? Uh, everything from housing policy, investment policy, procurement policy, taxation policy. Many reservations, for example, don't even have a official uniform commercial code. So an example of this is my colleague, Barb Stiffarm, who works for Fort Belknap in northern, north central um, Montana. And she has a really innovative, by local, by native initiative. If any of you folks are interested in this, please reach out to me. Uh, I'm, you know, we're, we're in early stages of putting this all together. It's a much bigger project than any of us can do on our own. But if you wanna get in touch with me, um, here are all of my factoids and I will make my slides available after today so that uh, Alice or whoever can share them with you. Thanks, Michael. I remember Locopedia when, when maybe you were first thinking of it. Um, <laughs> good to see where it's going. Um, all right, Michael Pardis, would you like to take the floor? Thank you, Alice. Thank you. So BCDI, the Bronx Cooperative Development Initiative, it, we're a community-led urban planning and economic development organization. But specifically, we're an eco-building organization. And by that, we're an eco-building organization that is advancing economic democracy in the Bronx, New York. And we do this through coordination, facilitation, and analysis. What's critical about this is for BCDI, we see our community and its people as assets. And so our role is to be the, the connective tissue that aggregates our community strengths and their work into a democratic, sustainable, human set of economic development projects and processes. What does that look like? It looks like providing research and analysis and convening a multi-stakeholder coalition that's creating a long-term people's economic development plan that's rooted in racial justice. And it looks like through that process, a community that's created 21 locally sourced economic development projects that are aligned to economic democracy, which you could find on bronx.consider.it bronx.consider.it. It also looks like hosting and facilitating teachings where our stakeholders can learn about innovative community wealth building projects from other parts of the country, such as a community's bid to purchase and develop a mall in the Crenshaw neighborhood of Los Angeles. And some of you can look at downtown Crenshaw and the incredible work that they're doing. Our work also looks like managing the coordination between community organizers, tenant associations, and minority-owned businesses. Like for example, a pest management company that are all working together, the community organizers, the tenants, and the minority-owned business that are working together to get at the root causes of pest management and rodents, but doing it in a sustainable way. Ecosystem building and economic democracy also looks like communication and convening to inform policymakers 
of the impact that green entrepreneurs and business owners in the Bronx are having, like KD New York, a fashion manufacturer that is upscaling, that wants to upscale waste into fibers for fashion manufacturing, and an ag tech enterprise called Reborn Farms, which is looking to repurpose shipping containers to, to serve as a STEM classroom focused on ag tech. So what I just described in our ecosystem building work, what I just described is what I believe is a human-centered approach to place-based work. It's sourcing and scoping from the community in order to build the future. It's open access to education, specifically on innovation. It's coordinating and convening. So local practitioners and leaders have the space, time, and support to continue not to start, but to continue solving their own problems. And it's the amplification of visionary, values-driven businesses and enterprises that are committed to the green economy in a place like the Bronx. When you take this approach, when the unit of the analysis is that the people who live, who work, who play, who worship in these places. When that's your unit of analysis, I think it makes a really nice entree into what Schumacher was talking about with, with the qualitative impact of economic processes. And when you look at the qualitative impact of economic processes, when your unit of analysis is human-centered and it focuses on community, what are the things you see? You are able to recognize things like outside of schools during drop-off and pickup, you'll see a line of Uber drivers. And you'll wonder why, why are there so many Uber drivers lined up in front of a school that pick up and drop off? But then you realize that it's because that gig work gives them the flexibility to work around their children or their family member's school schedule. And that begins to make you wonder, why is one of the most exploitative aspects of our community the best option for our people who wanna just be able to pick up and drop off their kids from school? You also learn similarly that there's a reason why our local worker-owned cooperative and cleaning services, why is it an all-women worker-owned cooperative? It's because if the cleaning service company, if they can pick up contracts to clean offices at night, it actually better allows them to take care of their children. They don't have to worry about childcare if they have young children. And then you begin to wonder why in our economy is there not is there not enough space for families to be together, for people to work, that they have to split their time? This qualitative approach also helps you understand why unregulated, or helps you see rather, why unregulated construction by developers, how that is actually, who are trying to drive down prices, how that's a driver of pests and rodent problems in neighborhoods, no matter how much community tries to fight or service. And then you begin to wonder why is construction allowed to abandon environmental best practices? And then you see a fashion manufacturer who wants to upscale food waste into fibers for the development of garments, how they have to coordinate a system of waste management and composting is not scaled and that is not coherently organized. And you begin to say, why? Why is that the case? Why is that? And so what it all demonstrates is that production is not just the economic process, which Schumacher clearly um, informs us and highlights for us, that the production is not just the economic process, it's also a social and cultural one. And so aside from just shifting the economy into one that is sustainable and democratic, at BCDI, we also are beginning from the premise that in spite of the socioeconomic background, and the chronically stereotyped um, narratives about our community. Our working class Bronx sites are highly productive. They're abundant in ideas, vision, practice, and values. And the history of our community's productive capacity is the community organizers that rebuilt our housing infrastructure through sweat equity and cooperative management in the 1970s and 80s. The Bronx was burning, but it was not burnt down, right? Our activists and our organizers rebuilt and maintained and fought. 
We also see that the persistence of organizers and activists who fought back against environmental harm in our county, like hazardous waste management, harmful transportation policy, inequitable access to natural resources like our Bronx River. But those community organizers and activists, they created community plans, neighborhood plans that have bike paths, access to waterways, common green space for the public. And on that foundation is what is happening now with our long-term economic planning, our coordination with stakeholders to solve their own problems, our work with entrepreneurs and business owners that are committed to a green economy, and our analysis that the extractive part of the economy, when you take a qualitative lens, and when you look at production, not just as economic, but what it is doing socially, lends itself to something different, something more human-centered, and something that is more holistic. And at BCDI and our work, we look at that and happy to share more during the rest of our time. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you all. Um, that was a great way to kick us off. And now we have a bunch of good questions coming in to the question and answer box. Um, but I also, I thought I might kick it off and then we could also um, open it up for any of you to ask each other questions. Um, but I thought I would start with one question um, that was inspired by Michael Pardis's mention of democratic economic democracy. Um, and that's probably not a term that everybody has heard before. Um, but what it what it invokes for me is um, community decision making on economic matters. I mean, democracy involves decision making. Um, and so often I think people are used to just the business owner, the one business owner making decisions um, or, um, you know, the CEO of a company or the shareholders of a company. Um, so I wondered if if we're going to apply the idea of democracy to economic matters, and that could be businesses, it could be about other kinds of resources or resource use in our communities. Um, maybe could each of you share or anybody who's inspired share some examples of mechanisms that allow that kind of community decision making to happen at whatever scale you're thinking about. I could maybe kick us off. Um, in the Bronx, we've been using the assembly model. And we've actually used the assembly model during COVID, during the pandemic, when more people were sheltering in place. And we had to figure out how, how do you do this? But the assembly model was really important for the sourcing component, right? Part of democracy and part of collective decision making requires sourcing broadly and listening broadly, right? It doesn't really narrow the set of information, right? There's not a information asymmetry. And so through our assembly model, what we did is we prioritized doing a SWOT. So we opened the community to understand the different sectors of our economy. And we asked them, what's a the strength? From your position, from the building you live in, the place that you work, the park that you go to, from your position, what's a strength in our economy in this sector? What's a weakness? What's a threat? What's an opportunity? And so that very simple way of open, using the assembly model to open up a sourcing of people's analysis and ideas is really important, I think, as a first step towards collective decision making. It's the recognition that um, our unit of analysis, again, right, starts with people and that we have to source what they're feeling, what they're hearing, what they're seeing, what they think is an asset, what they think is a strength. And then from there, um, how do we kind of align Right, but I think beginning with the assembly model um, for demo for a democratic process is something important. I maybe add to that, uh, Michael. This is one of these times that you wish you lived in Switzerland, which seems to have the most direct democracy in the world. Don't they go out and do poll direct polling to ask everybody's opinion on everything? Um, and and I think it's a country that's organized around very uh, smaller. It's it made the whole is made of smaller, very direct parts. Um, I would say maybe an example from Fogo Island, because our fishery, which has three fish processing plants, is owned by the by the people who fish and the people who work in the fish plant. Um, I mean, that model is a classic co-op model that those shareholders choose board members who are local people that are involved in the fishery. And then that, that board chooses a management team. And of course, there are different scales of decisions. And I think scale is an important 
consideration when we think about what are good mechanisms for different scales. So at the scale of Fogo Island, which has give or take 2,500 people, um, public sentiment is very, you feel it, you hear it, you confront it in the grocery store. And so it, it's, I would say a lot happens just because in, in like in our shore fast operations, one third of the households on the island work one way or another in what we're doing. So there's that, those mechanisms. So I think if the ownership model is right, you're kind of getting it in, it's in built into your skin in the way that uh, you may not need to have it. Although why not have a, a Switzerland style that's quote and ask everybody, good use of digital technology maybe. Thank you. So I think the example that I would add uh, has to do with capital. And unfortunately, I, I feel like the, there's a lot of understanding, appreciation about the importance of local ownership, but there's less appreciation that you cannot have local ownership without local capital and local investment. And right now, most of our investment, I'm sure for most people who are listening here, to the extent you have any savings and you've put it away in some kind of savings account for retirement or a rainy day, it is in publicly traded companies. It Very few of us have money in the local economy. And I, some of the greatest acts of democratization that I've seen involve cracking open that system and helping people to choose to move their money out of the public markets, out of the global economy, and into local business. And the, really the best example that I can think of is in Port Townsend, Washington. Uh, 1997, they created something called LION, Local Investment Opportunity Network. I'm sorry, 2007. And LION is started as just a potluck where businesses and potential investors got together once a month and chatted. But out of those relationships in a 10,000 person town, they have mobilized a million dollars per year in new investing in local industry. And, and to me, that is a model for how we should start organizing, shifting our capital resources in every community and not just in the United States, not just in North America, but in the world. Thank you. Um, do you, any of you have questions for each other? I also have questions lined up. Maybe for Michael, can I build on that question? I think you're, I think you're absolutely right about capital. And I've been, you know, times, right? Uh, with the recent banks, um, and what's been happening with them, uh, Signature and the, the Silicon banks. Just thinking about, it's obviously an opportunity to think about what can the banking structure be democratic? Can money and capital actually be a democratic instrument when it is used to, this is a leading question, perhaps, <laughs> I kind of opinion, but can it be a, a, a democratic tool actually to invest in work on cooperatives and other kind of cooperative business and enterprise. Yeah, I, I, I think we have to push in that direction. And, uh, you know, in the United States, we're in a funny position where banking is now about, I don't know, 10 to 12 percent of the overall financial universe. So getting banking right is important. But getting stocks, bonds, mutual funds, pension funds, and insurance funds right is even more important. And people are just unaware of where their money is living. Um, and, I, and I feel like you know, creating instruments that allow people to invest in co-ops uh, or community enterprise is, is really critical. Um, I do want to, I have a question for Zia, because I have just spent a little bit of time um, looking at some of the community-based finance mechanisms in Canada, um, that New Brunswick has a tax credit for local investment, 
that um, Michigan is now trying to imitate and Nova Scotia has a community-based pension fund. So I, I wonder if you might reflect a little bit on some of the innovations you've seen around you in Canada. Yeah, I don't think that we as a country are leading in this, Michael. So it's good that you found some examples in this. Um, I think one of the things that's happening in Canada, right, I don't know the two that you mentioned, even though those are in the Atlantic uh, provinces, the same as us. But one of the things that's happening in Canada now is a push to get something that you have in the United States and uh, is um, ESOPs, what you call ESOPs, that here will be employee ownership trusts. This is such a powerful tool because employees are embodied creatures and humans who live in the place and work in the place. And I think there are, are a lot of studies that have proved that they actually make the best shareholders and they have long-term views on things. And so creating the proper tax environment for this to be possible in Canada is something that we, we have a number of very, very many smart people activated on uh, right now. And there was an example recently of Taylor Guitars in California, I think it was family owned business. I don't know the story really well and I don't play guitar, but I know they're worshiped uh, guitars that uh, the family was maybe aging out and somehow a, a Canadian fellow that uh, has been very active in this space named Bill Young was, was I think pivotal in helping convince one of the big Canadian pension funds. And we have some enormous pension funds to actually get involved and lend the money to the ESOP in California so that employee group could own the company. Like that is a, that's a huge win. And employees are local, generally. So I have a question, uh, not to bring bring the conversation down too much, because um, I've we've been hearing a lot about the creativity that that happens in local communities and local economies and how people can build off of what they know to make great community businesses. Um, but I, I had a question come into the, the question and answer box about, you know, we, we all, what if we recognize that ownership matters, but then most of the ownership belongs to a few people and especially some of the things that are fundamental to being able to build businesses and economies such as land ownership. Um, have any of you found um, methods or models that can bring pressure to push, you know, capital and land ownership back out of the private market towards communities? So I'll, right. I'll, I'll put a couple of things on the table. So uh, one of the things that uh, Schumacher and the legacy stands for is community land trusts as a way of building opportunities for affordable housing. And um, my newsletter, the Main Street Journal, you know, we try to keep track of what's going on, mostly in the United States, but also internationally, you know, in this field. And it's really just been striking how many places are now moving community land trust front and center as a legitimate tool for dealing with affordable housing. Um, and, and you know, some models are better than others and some are further along than others. But I do think that um, the, if you put together community land trusts along with various local investment mechanisms, so a, a, a community land trust is a nonprofit. It can create a fund on top of it. If people put money in that fund, the land trust is then capable of acquiring more properties more quickly, and you can move faster on the provision of affordable housing. So I think that kind of creative stuff you see in a lot of uh, bigger cities. Um, I'm impressed, and, I, and Michael, maybe you can comment on this. I'm impressed that you know New York um, is trying to nudge a little bit away from given giving properties um, that the city acquires away to developers and making that more accessible to community-based groups for affordable housing. But I'll turn it over to you for some of that. I think the, on the organizer side, we've been highly successful 
and kind of highlighting like these innovative ways that we can use the trust, the land trust plus the fund in order to develop housing. It's actually why I asked you the capital question though, then the capital question becomes a challenge, right? By an example, a, a, a small, maybe 30, 40 unit um, building in our uh, county, in our borough as we call them in the Bronx, it would probably require about 25 million to do the rehab, to do the every, um, to do um, the renovation, the construction. And then half of the game is getting the policy shift just to be able to have community ownership of that. And then the second half of the game is what is the, where is the financial products? And in New York city and state, we are very far behind in those innovative um, kind of financial products and tools that would actually allow us to be able to own um, and do it the right way, I think is the key part too. Um, and so, yeah, like, I think there's a learning and communication strategy that actually collectively that we need to think about in order to, for these innovative products to be used. I mean, the pensions, there's a long line of these things. I think, but building on that to, to Alice's question, I guess one thing I'm seeing that makes me hopeful is it continues to be what people are doing. Um, and, you know, even in KD New York, this example of KD New York, uh, a fashion manufacturer that does uh, fiber development, upcycling waste into fiber, who is now in the Hutts Point uh, neighborhood of the Bronx, they have a model called equity across stakeholders. So they're trying to develop a model where community members, low dollars across to employees will have an ownership stake and then do the strategy setting and et cetera. And it's important because it's not a... It's not a micro business, right? Which is one of the things I think is a, a little bit of a challenge for us in the cooperative world. The micro businesses compared to like a place like New York where there's like eight, 10 million people, right? A micro business can do, um, what is the purpose of a micro business? A social point or an economic point? But this KD New York business is, is a relatively big uh, um, business with a really successful business owner who we've been able to bring into the kind of worker ownership a piece of this. And so his equity across stakeholders, we're hoping for, you know, something like upscaling food waste, which can be um, from a life science and intellectual property perspective, really an important economic strategy. If he's willing to set the example with equity across stakeholders, it actually at minimum gives us hope that we shouldn't give up or like we can build industry, we can do place-based industry with people, business owners and, and, and worker owners who share in our values um, and is willing to do that innovation. And if big and if a company like that is willing to do it, then will the policy system respond in a way that's according? So like threading those needles, um, people are doing it. It's these institutions and structures that we are continuing to like pressure, no matter how many banks collapse, I guess we still have to keep the pressure on them to uh, innovate in policy and in legislation. Mm -hmm. Zita, did you have any ideas there that you wanted to share or do you have a question you'd like to ask? Yeah, no, maybe maybe more around capital. And I think, I'm, I'm, what is it called? The Center for Community Investing is another American, I'm not sure what state it's in. And they have the best tagline ever. The tagline is resources follow coherence. And, and it's often the case in communities that we're not particularly coherent. In other words, you got the business crowd saying one thing and the housing crowd saying another thing and the mayor saying another thing. And so this kind of coming together. One of the things that we've been working on to try and uh, contribute to solving the availability of financial capital problem, if you talk to, I mean, like you, it, at the biggest level, there's a lot of money in the world. In fact, there could be too much money in the world because it's all looking for a place to go. And in, in so doing, it's investing in things that maybe are not all that helpful to people. But if you say, okay, how do we get some of this money to come through this small project, whether it's in the Bronx or on Fogel Island or wherever it is, the, the first thing you get told by people who manage money is there's too much friction. It's like too small a scale. I can't deal with it. And so one of the things we are working on is, can we create a, a structure for a community finance fund that is a receptive fund that any community could adopt. We, we want to work out the governance structure for it, which is a little bit complicated because there are different provinces or in your country, different states involved. But still, even a neighborhood could have a, a finance fund that 
has a governance structure that is, decisions are made locally. The purpose of the fund is to give comfort to whoever owns the financial capital that's coming in, that we're gonna manage it, we're gonna deploy it to projects that line up with our priorities here locally, and we're gonna report back to you. And, and I think there's something to that because it would allow us to work at different scales. And it's another Schumacher kind of thing. I don't, I actually don't, we're gonna to have to dig them up and ask them, but I actually don't think he meant that everything should be small. I think what, what the way I always interpreted his work is, you get too big through a whole bunch of networked smalls. And I think we're living in a time of the platform. Power lives with the people who control the platform. And, and I think that for all of us that are involved in community economic development, we gotta, like, we gotta build a platform, Michael, so that we have a place to put all these stories that you've been collecting that are really important because we can all learn from every single one of them. But, uh, but I think creating the, the kind of new bits of plumbing that allow financial capital to flow with some kind of decision making in the local can be a game changer. I think you're absolutely right. It makes it it, it makes me curious of do you build the infrastructure first or do you get the capital first? Like either, I, I'm not making it an either or both, but the kind of the if you build the infrastructure first, it can give you the coherence and then the capital comes and then the thing operates. Um, but there's also a thing of as time is going and building a cooperative, collective decision-making governance entity, the time that that takes compared to like getting cap, like there's some interesting things from practitioners, right? Just from a practitioner point of view of like just how to coordinate and do the dots at the same time. You know, you use my favorite word in the whole world practice practitioners because that you know that's we're, we're going to talk michael schumann you had a, some comment earlier about practice and we got to talk we can't have this conversation without talking about eleanor olstrom at least for a minute that which is possible in practice is possible in theory right so so michael to your question about what do you do first yeah it's probably it's a, it's a yogi Berra answer right it's yeah we're going to take that for but I, I think to do it though would be to talk to whoever it is it could be it could be BlackRock for all I know. It could be like take some monster, enormous pool of money and say, listen, we're trying to build something here. If we built it like this, could this be something that you could actually salute in some way? Um, you know, and this is a problem across for policymakers as well. Like many, many, many policies that will come down from any federal government, by the time they're designed and deployed, they don't work for all of the different situations. They don't work for all of the scales. And usually the scale's too big for small places like Fogo Island. Um, but I think if we can build a receptive, it's it's like impedance matching, build a receptive plumbing that someone that, that is managing a big pool of money can actually, you can build a relationship with. So I, I would say we need to work on both sides of this. You need to work on the education of the grassroots to understand the importance of moving whatever capital they're going to have into local enterprise, but we also need instruments that allow the collective deployment in a more efficient way. And I, I do wanna call out um, my colleagues at a place called NC3, um, National Coalition for Community Capital. Um, they've done a lot of work on um, what are exemptions within the Investment Company Act that would allow U.S. communities to step forward and create investment funds at scale that could, you know, that don't cost a lot. And the best answer that they've come up with is actually a real estate company, because it turns out that real estate companies are exempt from the Investment Company Act. And uh, if you can do a combination of real estate and business support at scale, in a very cost-effective way. So uh, I'll, I'll try to post something um, in the chat here where people can get more information about that. So I would love to go to kind of maybe a little more of a philosophical question. Um, I got a couple of questions that came in that kind of have implied, I think, um, conflict in them. So 
One is, um, in what ways does economic localization make things cheaper for residents rather than more expensive? So that's kind of, I, I love that spin on it because I think often people think that local makes things more expensive. Um, and then this person's asking, how do they, how does economic localization make things cheaper? Um, so I wonder if there's something that comes out of that for all of you. And then there's this other question, which is how can a community ensure that the new community businesses are going to be sustainable and restorative? So it's kind of saying, like, how do we keep a check on these things um, to make sure they're doing what we want? So I, those are two very different questions, but I wonder if they inspire um, any of you. So I'll speak to the scale issue. Um, I, I think that since Ernst Schumacher wrote his book, the trends in the global economy have actually moved in favor of the local. And the biggest trend that has moved in favor of the local is the shift from goods to services. And at this point, you know, something like, I don't know, 75%, 80% of the jobs in the US economy are service related, broadly defined, including health services, financial services. And services are inherently local uh, because people want a relationship that they know and trust. And when you look at the remaining part of people's consumption in goods, um, most of what people spend their money on are what are called non-durable goods. And non-durable goods, things you consume a lot of, are things like food and building materials. These things weigh a lot. They have a low dollar value per unit weight. And it means that it doesn't make sense to ship, say, water, which is what food really is, halfway around the planet. Um, it just is completely economic nuts to do that, unless it's, you know, scotch whiskey, we can draw some exceptions here and there. But, but the point is, is that we now see ways of moving to 90% plus localization in a cost effective way. And one piece of evidence for this is that every time you have a buy local campaign, people find cheaper local goods and services. If it was the case that local stuff was always more expensive. Buy local campaigns would be a flat out failure. None of them have been that way. Yeah, I don't, I don't it, Michael, I hope you're right. <laughs> and, I, and I hope there's more evidence for that. I think, again, I'm coming from a community which is geographically very distant uh, from a, a large center and uh, a small population. Although the island itself is four times the size of Manhattan, it's only got 2,500 people. So if you look at a turnip, which most people would think of as a rutabaga, that's grown on Fogo Island, uh, which has all of the attributes you wish a turnip would have to be chemical free and all of that, I would say that is not going to be a cheaper turnip than one that you could go to the mainland, drive to Gander and get a turnip if you're just looking at the, the cost of the turnip. And I think part of what- But that it, drive costs something. Exactly. And so that's the answer. Exactly. And one of the great Schumacher quotes, and it was like the way he wrote it was, and it was in Small is Beautiful, he said, our task, so he goes, our task is to try to see the world as whole. Our task is to try to see the whole picture. So I think what we've been accustomed to in the consumer age is, you know, this kind of reductionist thinking around, you're just looking at the price, the price of the financial price on the turnip right now, as opposed to the greater cost of going to Gander, the greater cost of the money leaving the island. So I think, I think I'm encouraged by the fact that I think there is more and more of that kind of more holistic thinking uh, about what is the cost of this turnip. We practice something that we call economic nutrition labeling. That is another thing we'd like to see in, adopted more broadly in the world, and we have work to do to get there. But basically, we tell you for everything that you buy, there, we have a label that looks an awful lot like the label on the cornflakes box that tells you what's in it, and it simply tells you um, where the money goes. And it tells you in the moment of purchase. I, I think these kinds of tools help you see the, the world as if it was whole. Sounds like uh, nonprofit uh, fundraising. If you give us the money, this is what we'll do with it. 
Um, but on topic here, one of the interesting things on the localization, the relationship between localization and a service-based economy, for us at BCDI, we've been looking at B2B. Um, and because there's these major institutions, you know, and this is like the eds and meds kind of thing. But not just looking at them from the workforce, but looking at them from services that they procure and that they purchase. Now, often we look at the public sector, right, and where they purchase and how they procure, because there's a much greater like public accountability to it. But we look at a lot of these major institutions that are nonprofits, right? They, they actually get a tax assumption, the major hospitals that function like corporations or um, higher education institutions. Where are they purchasing their services from? Where are they purchasing their goods from? And overwhelmingly, they're not looking local, right? So there's actually a huge kind of opportunity there to look at these folks who are in the IRS tax code, nonprofits, getting tax deductions and all type of other subsidies, but their local spend is minimal, right? They're actually spending way outside. So it's a market access question, interestingly, um, that we're still trying to crack because then it becomes a supply chain kind of issue. And then it, it goes into that reductive production thinking. It will drive people into that. Well, we have to be at value. We have to do this, like that economic rationality in order to be competitive for a bid. Like how do we kind of undermine that and shift the systems so that way that service-based economy can be an effective localized um, way of, of growing the economy that is sustainable and that is human centered. I think the only other thing about the, the flip side to that, Michael, that we could talk maybe offline that we see though, is that then a lot of the service-based economy, the wages, right? Particularly the wages, the salaries are lower and then it's a catch, it's a catch, I don't wanna say catch 22, but it becomes a conundrum to like figure out. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, no, I was just going to say this historically has been true, but interestingly, the wage verdict has shifted in the last couple of years. So uh, the difference between manufacturing wages and the average service wage, service wage in the United States is very small right now, and it's shrinking. And, and some services, like, and I mentioned several of them, financial services, health services, they pay a lot more than manufacturing. So what you do for service depends a lot on what the wages are going to be. So oh, go ahead, Zita. Yeah, I was going to ask Michael, well, this is very confusing having two Michaels. And I have a brother that's Michael, so it's very confusing. Um, Michael Schumann, in your four things that you put up as kind of pillars, I don't know if you use that word, you had uh, spread models. Why don't we start today? We could work together and build a platform, a digital platform to put all of this knowledge. How do we spread models? Well, that's definitely one of the, the that's part of the work we do at the Schumacher Center. And what, maybe that's what we're doing right now. Um, so you can always, we have a lot of resources to share on the, on the website of the Schumacher Center. Um, with even legal documents you can download and copy for your own community, for a community land trust, um, or to learn about local currencies. So um, we're all expert model sharers here. I'm very excited to be um, talking with all of you. And there's been so many questions um, in, the, in the chat that I don't know how we're gonna get to um, any percentage of them, but there's been a lot just saying, what's the name of that? What's the name of that book? What's So I think that um, our valiant Schumacher staff is going to be, have their work cut out for them. Um, but also if we, maybe we can follow up um, after this panel with some of the resources you, you all have mentioned. Um, uh, somebody asked, what is the labeling term that Zeta mentioned? We we call it we've trademarked it. It's called economic nutrition. Economic trademark. nutrition. And it and the way it works, and I don't know if one any of my colleagues who are online can actually post it so people can see it. The way it works is at the top, it simply tells you what kind of expense items um, the money you just spent go to. Like how much went to the people that made that chair and how much went to marketing and how much went to profit. And then at the bottom comes the magic, I think. 
which is, well, it's all magic to me because if we, if we can get people to really get their arms around the economy uh, and understand it, then, they're, they're, then we're going to be really cooking with gas, as they say. At the bottom, it tells you where the money goes geographically. How much stays, you just spent that, how much stays here? How much goes this far? How much, like in our case, in our province, how much stayed in the country? How much, you know, we, and then the rest of the world. And like, this is just arithmetic. This is not, it's like when the food labeling started, everybody got up in arms, I gather. I, this started in California in my lifetime. And the first thing was, well, you know, if we have to do this, the industrial food companies probably said, you know, a box of cornflakes is going to cost $100 because it's so hard to do this. We do it. We can do <laughs> it too. I mean, I think this is the most radical transparency that I can think of around bringing the money into the moment. And, and really, all of the things we're talking about at one level or another is how do we tame money? How do we tame it? How do we bring it home? How did we get it to work for us at home? So on the on the question of kind of data and information sharing, um, we had a number of questions come in um, that were inspired by the idea of building platforms and building the correct plumbing to create a stronger local economy. Um, so we had a question saying, what role does technology play in supporting economic localization? And associated with that question from somebody else, though, was somebody who works with students. She's a teacher in California, and she works with students using data and research to develop apps to support sustainability. And she said, what ideas do you all have for what her students could work on? Um, so any, any thoughts there? I think we have to out Bezos, Jeff Bezos. You know, to, I mean, I, I, when I say a digital platform, I mean a digital platform <laughs> that becomes a standard. And here's a, a kind of, maybe I'll throw it. Uh, what if it looked like this? What if it was a platform that every community has its own portal that it controls? And so every community can make a digital twin of itself. And somehow, I think if we can't figure out how to exist in the digital world in some way that's on our own terms, we're going to be, you know, somebody's product uh, in the digital world. So, I mean, when I think about, and of course we have an in, so we think about the visitor economy a lot and how, you know, we are represented as a place in the world. And, you know, you think of any of these kind of monopolistic plot platforms that have interfered with local economies so that and I, we, I, we all know what they are, I don't need to name them. But if you were going to visit Milwaukee, imagine if there was a portal you went to for Milwaukee that says, oh, places to stay in Milwaukee that is actually fully controlled by that place and the people in that place, uh, whether it's a place to stay or a place to eat, that, that you are, they are the curators of their own place. I, in, in that way. And on that platform and, and the local place decides what they want to share would be the data. Like sometimes we, we think we know how we are until we actually see the data. Well, how many people are we and what, who are we that live here? And how many, I don't know, do you want to count your churches? You want to count your graveyards? I mean, these are, we to be able to make visible to the people that are there, I think, and under the control of people that are there, the data about and the, everything that's knowable can be reduced to a piece of data. And so I think then you can start to work together more effectively because we don't have to argue as much about the facts and that data exists out in the world it's just rarely under the never mind the control even the access of the local people who need it so that kind of a big platform that platform that i'm thinking of would be also for policy makers i mean i i mean actually schumacher talks about this i i think most people get up in the morning and intend to do good a few notable exceptions we won't name uh, but somehow, you know, between their feet hitting the floor and in the morning and going to bed at night, they don't always do their best. Like we all set out to do the right thing. But I, I think the more we can work from a, a shared information set, policymakers want to make policy that make things better for people. And I would say in most corporations, yes, there is the, 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 the quarterly results and the, the shareholder primacy that we're trying to find our way out of. But even still, if we can present to board members and management teams in big companies, this is our local, this is how you can work with us. I think I think we'd have some success. Maybe that sounds kind of Pollyanna-ish, but I think a platform that for all of the economic actors to be able to do better.
Yeah, I mean, I'll just add that with the Native American uh, communities that I've been working with, the federal data that are available in those communities are completely wrong. And, and there, there's no hope in trying to fix them, but there is hope in trying to replicate it. And, and you know, to the person who asked, what can I have students do? I would say, here's, here's two really simple projects. First, put up a website of the kind uh, uh, that was just being talked about and list all of the local businesses that are on the website and give people a sense of, you know, what your economy looks like and if they want to localize their spending, where they should be going. Second, whenever any of these businesses is raising capital, now there are laws you have to be mindful of, but there are ways of doing it on the cheap. Whenever a business is raising capital, put that information on your website and, and, make it clear that there are ways that you can invest in these local businesses and industries. Um, it's interesting when, um, I was, when I was a, a young lad, when I was a graduate student, I was in, uh, some of you all know the geographer, David Harvey in his capital class. And, uh, the first day of class in political economy, he would ask us, you know, where did your breakfast come from? Um, and it was really a question around sourcing, right? Like getting us really to understand the source of what we buy, purchase, consume. And it's a simple thing, but I think for students, especially like, especially that I have an urban bias, of course, you know, un, 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 uncontrollably, but just getting them to think about that supply chain and like how, like where is things coming from? Not just like, sensationalist news and journalism that says who's making this where like actually where and I think fashion is and clothing is actually a simple kind of step where was your clothing made like how far back in the supply chain can you go not just where it was produced and but where did the materials come from like sourcing that all the way back and visualizing that so even if just your class did it everyone can see like the brand or the company that they wear and how far back can we trace it really opens up your mind, I think, to um, how the economy is working or not working. When you put that, like the sourcing with what Michael mentioned, which is like then the category, category, um, categorizing of these are the businesses and in what concentration they exist, you start, the gap start to be like, oh, wow, we don't have any furniture makers. Like, riddle me that. Oh, we don't we have abundance of finance? Oh, we have a lot of hotels. We don't have enough food. But everything we eat comes, they'll start to make sense of it. And then the values part. Then you have a values-based uh, um, curriculum around like reparosity, cooperation, uh, distribu like equitable distribution, et cetera. Then that matches the gaps. And then students begin to take their basic social studies class, their basic like history class, and they map it on together to be uh, practitioners of cooperative economics, economic democracy, uh, enterprise development in the ways that we need and think. Well, you all just anticipated the next theme that I wanted to come to, um, which was to think about um, education and culture shift. Um, we've had a lot of questions about education and um, and kind of also the thought that we have a culture, like, I, I see two things happening here. I mean, I hear from all of you about communities where people are already shifted into this kind of local economic thinking. Um, but at the same time, we have a lot of uh, what somebody wrote as current exploitative economic fictions that are constantly assaulting us. Um, and these stories about ourselves and about our economy that are kind of you know, how the world is, is working. And we kind of sometimes just say, okay, that's how it is. So I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, where examples of where you see education shifting or opportunities for bringing this thinking into education. Um, and, and I, I think it even connects to a bigger kind of spiritual, uh, you know, um, 
practice or principles, somebody asked, what role do spiritual principles play in these models of development? And how do you re rewrite some of the current exploitative economic fictions? So I just wondered if you wanted to talk about kind of where you see that culture shift happening or ways that we can help it happen. I'll mention one area that I see it happening. And so I, for the last seven years, I've been teaching for a green MBA program at Bard College, which is, uh, the program is based in New York. And it's amazing how fast the growth of this program and the growth of the demand has been from youngish people. They're not just out of college. Most of them are late 20s, 30s, sometimes 40s, in the middle of their career who really want to get the business skills. And there's enormous interest in not in replicating Enron or Amazon, but in really doing this at a community level. Um, not everyone can go to business school. Not everyone has that time or resources. But one of the things that um, the Bard group College is doing, which I think is really interesting, is they are connecting with community colleges around the country and trying to educate like one staff person in a community college who can then sort of train the trainer on how to get some of the basics about rebuilding the economy. So I feel like People are working on the problem. There's interest in this. There's excitement around it. Um, and the fact that the right is so apoplectic about ESG taking over everything shows we're winning. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, the sometimes we have too many words in the world and not enough just doing. And I think the more we can make visible, the more we can develop tools that demonstrate how something works. I mean, the simple act of being in a place, pick any place, and making a map of all of the economic actors in our local economy. So for example, Michael, earlier you were talking about institutions, some of them not-for-profits, you know, who who are charities that, you know, benefit from the largesse of all of the taxpayers in the country because they, you know, they actually got a tax break for the people who donated to them are not actually mindful of or participating properly in the local economy. But if they are mapped and made visible, what and this can be done on digital platforms, we on, on Fogo Island, we're looking at how do we actually, just with big sheets of paper, map our economy so that everybody can see it. And so when you map that economy, you're actually setting a table that has all of us as economic actors at it. And so we can say to, if I don't know who that not-for-profit is or that university or like it, all economic actors, what is your relationship to the local economy? And I think it's just that kind of, a, that's very specific doing as opposed to, you know, pointing out the problem in 10,000 words, which all of us are probably good at, <laughs> uh, that, that might, that might uh, cause some change. Um, I'll give everyone a heads up that I'm going to say some websites. So I know people are going to ask to repeat it. So a heads up from now, everyone, um, I'll build on the recent point. There's a excellent mapping project on solidarity economy, businesses and enterprises. It's only in New York. Um, it's map M A P dot G O go co op C O O P nyc.org map.gocoopnyc.org map.gocoopnyc.org um and, and that is a wonderful mapping of the solidarity economy in the Bronx, in sorry in New York New York City um a lot of respect and admiration to scenic the local um, organization that's done that mapping work um, they do excellent work. I want to shout them out for, to the point of using platforms. And education is like making it public and making it visible, right? So that's one. I think we've had an interesting experiment in the Bronx 
with our long-term community economic development planning work where we took and sourced the community um, projects and synthesized them into 21 proposals that are public. You could go see the proposals. You could get like a two-page scope of the community source economic development project that's aligned to the solidarity economy and to economic democracy. And you can find those 21 projects on bronx.consider.it. Bronx.consider.it. So you can see those sources. And, and, and I bring it up, those are two ways of, at least on the information side, like breaking the silo and educating the public and highlighting what has been happening. Um, if you go to bcdi.nyc, we have an economic democracy learning center. And there you'll be able to see, we just ran a pilot with five local high schools on cooperative economics and leadership. So what would it look like to be a facilitator, coordinator, convener on bringing people together to create these economic development plans to cooperatively run a business or housing, like that kind of seeding um, with young people, we've been doing that. And so if you go to bcdi.nyc and in the drop down, go to the Economic Democracy Learning Center, Economic Democracy Learning Center, you'll be able to learn more about this pilot with these five high schools. The key was that it was the students and the administrators, not just all oh, the students go do this, right? Even the admins had to learn how to be cooperative. <laughs> how does cooperative, how does cooperativism work for business management, business planning, enterprise, worker ownership, housing, that, that type of governance and planning and strategy setting was important. So I think those are just three ways that I wanted to lift up, like practical, go look at making information visible, go look at sourcing from the community and, and sourcing feedback broadly, and look at an education example in a high school. Those are the, I could talk a lot more about this, but those are the three that I will offer. I, I, I think the one more would be equally as a professor. So I teach African-American history as an adjunct. And when we focus on the Black Wall Street section of our um, curriculum, I don't just focus on the big business kind of industry thing. One of the key things when you look at those Black Wall Streets like Tulsa, like the, like the Greenwood section of Tulsa, Jackson Ward in Richmond, Virginia, um, Durham in North Carolina. When you look at those Black Wall Streets, cooperation, they, they say it, the people themselves on the record in Tulsa, in Durham, in Jackson Ward, who had their own cooperative banks and other kind of associations. The primary source documents talk about cooperation. One woman says in Tulsa, you go to the Tulsa Museum, she says, I came here because of the cooperation of our people. Um, and so I think that's the, the last part of the intervention um, from including Jessica Gordon Nimbarm's work in the class to even thinking about economy, but really emphasizing those solidarity and cooperative kind of aspects makes, it allows people to say, this is not a new thing we're talking about here, right? And that's sometimes the first step. So I hope everybody captured all the websites and things. I'll answer questions on it, but that's my offering. Thank you, Michael. So we have just a few more minutes left, but I would love to welcome each of you to share some closing remarks, a couple of minutes. Um, and, and if you can, if you have any in mind, some positive action items for our attendees today. Well, maybe I can start. I think that, uh... To repeat, it's about the practice, it's about the specific. And any time you're going to buy something, ask the person selling it to you, where did it come from and where does the money go? And even if they don't know the answer, we I hope that the economic nutrition label print out the economic nutrition. So you should you could make one of these for everything that you sell. I think it's that specific. I think the in some ways, what we're talking about, and and Michael Portis, what you were just saying about Tulsa and places like that, how is the chicken and the egg question, but how do you get people to see that it's a positive sum game? Where do you start with that? Because places like you're naming that where it is based around collaboration or cooperation, 
they are already like, you know, eons ahead of, we've been so convinced. I mean, I, here's a project, maybe we could work on this together, which is we need to reinvent the game of monopoly. So it's a positive sum game, right? It was invented by by a woman who was trying to prove that private land ownership was terrible and we'd be bankrupting people. And instead of taking her message, we teach our children to bankrupt each other on Thanksgiving weekend. But now let's reinvent it so that we have a name, which would be no monopoly, uh, so that it's a positive sum game. We teach that on Thanksgiving. Thank you. Michael Schumann, do you wanna share? So I, I'll just, you know, follow the theme that I, I have been talking about for the last hour plus, which is look at how you invest your money and everything from are you doing your banking in a place that's going to possibly go under because it's too big and unregulated and foolish in its practices, or are you going to do it in a local bank? Look at how you invest other kinds of savings. Um, I have the single most um, productive investment that I have made in my lifetime has been in the last year in putting solar on the roof, taking advantage of a tax credit. And I, uh, my wife and I did this by taking money out of a solo 401k. So we did it with retirement money. There are all kinds of options like this. And you know, everything from getting yourself self-reliant on water and energy and food, um, you know, investing in those things, those are all good for your community, good for your bottom line, um, and, and, and good for self-reliance. But, you know, that's just an entry and thinking about, okay, how can I invest in local businesses, local nonprofits? How can I invest in municipal bonds that are being issued for good projects. For example, the uh, state of Connecticut has issued green bonds to support solar in um, communities of color. And I, you know, I just think that we're seeing a revolution at the bottom on how people can invest their money. So challenge yourself to think about how to move 1% of your savings in the right direction next year. I'll be concise and quick. Um, I'm going to agree with my fellow panelists. If you're on the creative side of this, if you have the time and energy and entrepreneurial spirit to create, how do we gamify the learning on the solidarity, cooperativism, like a new economy? Like, how do we gamify that? People are increasingly spending less time on in books and in classrooms, and they're learning in a much wider environment. So games and gamifying that um, in, the, in a good way, not you know the other way. Gamifying it is important. I think the second point, if you're a practitioner, um, move your money out of the extractive economy. I think Michael's point really is strong. There are so many good projects and they struggle to get off the ground. They can't get through the R&D phase. They got to bootstrap it. They, they can't get to scale because they just don't have enough capital to do it. And so capital for good is a, is a small thing. In the smallest way possible, you can change your investment or purchase choice, do so. Um, it does matter. It don't, even if it's 99 cent, it does matter. At scale, it can grow. So those are my two offerings, for folks. Thank you all so much. Um, this has been an excellent conversation about localizing production, and I've learned so much. I hope our attendees have enjoyed it, and I want to thank all of our attendees for coming. Um, we also have a list of organizations on the Schumacher Center website on this, this event, the page for this event, that are related to this theme. We have a list of organizations that do this kind of work, um, so you can check that out on our website. And then next month, we have another panel similar to this um, on April 20th, and the theme is reallocating land from market to commons. So it's on that theme that we touched on today about how do we put land back in the hands of communities. Um, and the panelists will include Severin von Scharner Fleming of Agrarian Commons and, and Shord Wartena of Terre de Lien from France. Um, and we hope you can join us to continue the celebration of the 50th anniversary of Small is Beautiful.
We will have a panel like this every month for the whole year. So there's many options to join us again. Thank you all. Thank you, Michael Pardis. Thank you, Michael Schumann. Thank you, Zita Cobb. It's been a pleasure.